the BizTech's CEO Conversation show. Our guest for today is Richard Hunt, founder and CEO of Turnkey Consulting, coming out to us out of the UK. Turnkey Consulting is a leading provider of integrated risk management, identity access management, and cyber and application security. Built on nearly two decades of expertise, the firm helps organizations to safeguard their critical business applications to ensure the associated risks are minimized and controlled. Now to tell us more, welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for having me. Now, Richard, for a start, could you give us an overview of Turnkey and its history? Sure. Um, yeah, so I started my career um, at PwC, actually, one of the, the big audit firms, um, working on SAP systems and, and securing those systems for, for big clients um, back in the sort of early 2000s, late, to, uh, late 90s. Um, and I, I kind of saw an opportunity uh, to, to get that topic right um, in an independent way um, and, to, and to help clients to, to secure their, their critical business systems properly. Um, so, so historically, we've focused on, on SAP. Um, and our, and our, our kind of background is, is securing um, SAP systems for, for big um, organizations. Um, and a, a lot of huge companies run SAP, obviously. Um, and then over time, we've evolved into a, a more end-to-end -end, um, so, um, provider um, focused still exclusively on the services area. Uh, but we're, we're working in, as you say, those three practice areas, um, essentially looking to... to um, to help uh, businesses keep their systems safe. Um, so our, our vision is to, to make the world a safer place to do business. Okay, now you're a global company. What does your footprint look like globally and in particular the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, so so right from the outset really as a company, we've, we've always had an ambition to be a global company. Um, the the intention there is, is um, twofold really. I think our, our clients have uh, global footprints. They, they all tend to be large organizations. Um, and, and from the outset, we've, we've recognized that to, to serve those clients best, uh, we need to be able to operate across the, the, their organization. So um, we have operating centers out of the UK and London here. Um, in France, uh, Germany, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, and out of the US as well. Um, and so our, our, our key hubs in, in the Asia PAC region are in Kuala Lumpur, uh, in Singapore, and then we have offices in both Sydney and, and Melbourne. Now, tell us about your three key services, your integrated risk management, identity and access management, and cyber and application security. Walk us through how these really help a large organization. Yeah, so so I, I think the the key to, to go back to our vision, um, you know, we're helping uh, to make the world a safer place to do business. So to, to help us our customers make their IT environment safer um, and to make their organization safer, we wanted to focus on those three key topics because we see them as as critical and, and integrated to get things right. So so the uh, integrated risk management uh, practice that we operate. Uh, focuses on helping organizations to understand the business risks they have um, and to unpack those key business risks they might define at board level down into more detail um, and detailed risks they can manage. So, so helping customers to define their, their risk landscape and to actually manage that risk landscape with um, risk responses such as control activities. Um, then we have our, um, our identity and access management practice, which is helping customers to get the right access to people um, at the right time um, and to make sure that that access is, is removed when people leave the organization as well. So it's, it's about provisioning the right access to people in systems and, and removing that access in a, in a well-governed way um, and making sure that people understand the decisions you're asking of them when, when people join the organization, what access they're going to need, et cetera. Um, and then finally, the uh, application and cyber security practice that we have uh, helps customers to get the security right in their key business applications, one of which being SAP, where we have a, a strong specialization, um, and also to, to manage their cyber risk. So topics like cyber security awareness um, and, and making sure that um, 
people in the organization understand their role in, in managing um, risk and managing cyber threats is, is kind of key to, to our cyber practice, for example. Um, and we're also helping customers to get the permissions and responsibilities and access right within the, um, the key business application so that people have the right access to do their job, but don't have um, more access than they need um, at creating additional risk and additional threats to their organization. I think finally, the, the kind of overarching side of what we do um, is about making sure that customers are compliant with a lot of the, the kind of um, underlying um, responsibilities they have from a regulatory perspective, and in particular for their audit responsibilities. So our, our company is very sort of strong at making sure that our customers are prepared for their external audits um, one step ahead of those external audits, go beyond what those external audits might expect of them, um, and have the right governance processes in place to, to really keep their business safe. Now, Richard, you've got very large customers. You've got the likes of Coca-Cola, GSK, Shell, British Amer American Tobacco among your client list. What are the verticals that you focus on? And specifically, what are the verticals that you are very strong in in the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the customer list we have um, kind of comes off the back of our um, previous historical work with SAP, really. Um, so so we've, we've had a specialization in SAP and have been a leading partner in, in securing SAP systems for, for, you know, since the beginning of the company. And, and having been operating for 20 years, we've, we've developed a really kind of enviable client list. And I'm really proud of the customers that trust us to, to help them with their systems, you know. Um, and I think the so so the verticals, as it were, um, across the group really um, reflect the the customer landscape from SAP's perspective. So that's quite broad, really. Um, manufacturing is particularly strong, um, but uh, you, you know we're well represented in virtually every um, every vertical, really. And I think that a lot of the the risks we help customers with, particularly around things like IT general controls and stuff, are are actually quite. Um, quite common across all um, industries. They're not, they're, they're not always um, industry specific. We do have some, some specific expertise in some customers where they have particularly strong compliance requirements like pharmaceuticals, for example. Um, and I, I'd say in the APAC region, um, you know, we, we've worked with one of the largest utilities providers in, in the APAC region, for example. Um, and, and we've been working with a number of sort of government organizations as well, actually, in, um, in both Australia and, and Malaysia and Singapore. So then, uh, Richard, the services that you offer are often also delivered by large global consulting big names. Mm -hmm. What is Turnkey's value proposition? If I'm a CIO or a CISO, out of Malaysia, out of Australia or Singapore, why should I pick you over larger established brands in this space? Sure. I mean, that's, that's a great question, Brian. Um, I think, uh, and it's one, one that I'm obviously well prepared for because I have to fight this battle on a daily basis, right? <laughs> um, so I, I think the, the two kind of uh, key competitors to what we do in, you know, in, the, um, in the landscape would be the big four um, and the larger systems integrators. Um, so the, the big four audit firms do some of the type of um, services we offer and, and customers might go there for those types of services. What we tend to have is stronger technical skills in those, in those um, that, than in the, in the disciplines we operate. We do tend to have stronger technical skills and, and are able to develop um, stronger solutions that, that actually have a, a, a much better end-to-end -end, um, coverage of, of managing the risk that a customer has. Um, I, I think a lot of the time um, in the big four, you would be looking at a consultant who maybe had two, three years experience of, of working with some of the software products we work with. And we tend to have people who've got five to 10 years experience of working with those software products. And, and that gives them a more rounded understanding of the solution. You know. Um, so I think that's that's the um, that, that's our kind of value proposition uh, um, versus the the big four. Um, from a systems integrator's perspective, um, we tend to have stronger understanding of what the um, external audit and the compliance background is for some of these things. The, the systems integrators bring technical skills to to the table, but our teams tend to have um, a 
better understanding of the context of why we're putting these solutions in place. And I think the, the last thing I would say is that we strive to have all of our consultants having a rounded approach to, to solving problems for our customers. And, and we see there are three core skills to doing that, um, an understanding of the context around um, compliance and, and audit um, and regulatory requirements, um, an understanding of the business processes in which they're operating to make sure we can put the right controls in place across those business processes and, and identify the right control points in them. And then those technical skills. And I think, you know, as I've just said, the system integrators cover part of that kind of Venn diagram, but not all of it. The, um, uh, the audit firms tend to cover part of a different part, but not all of it. And our kind of value proposition is, is covering that whole Venn diagram and all, all of those kind of um, all of those key kind of areas that we recognize are, are, are right to get the problem solved. So obviously to cover all those Venn diagrams, you can't do everything alone and you've got third party partners and collaborators. Who do you work with to ensure that you give clients a, a good end to end solution? Yeah, so, so we're, a, we're a vendor agnostic provider in terms of the, um, the software products that we help customers to implement and then get, get those projects right. Um, but we do, we do have to work closely with key partners in order to develop, um, in order to, to implement their solutions and, and to get the, the implementation of those products right, you have to get close to the vendors and, and, and work closely with them. So, so we work very closely with um, SAP. That's one of our key sort of vendors that we've been working with for some time. Um, we're a key partner for SailPoint um, and one of their strongest partners in, in the APAC region. Um, Microfocus, similarly, we've been doing a lot of work with um, CyberArk, uh, uh, know before as well in the security and awareness training space um, and and a number of other cyber security vendors that we're kind of developing relationships with over time. So. Now, in your opinion, we're, we're, we're just starting 2023. What are some key risk management and cyber security trends that CISOs need to be cognizant of for 2023? Yeah, so I think the... I mean, this is a, a very, um, uh, the, the, it's an interesting topic. I, I think the the overriding thing at the moment is the geopolitical sort of landscape and, and background. Um, I, I'm not sat in Asia like yourself, but um, mm -hmm. over here in Europe right now, we've, we've got a war in Europe for the first time in, in my lifetime and, you know, a lot of people's lifetimes. And, and I think, um, you know, that um, that's kind of, very close to home for us, but I think it does represent a change in the geopolitical landscape. So I think what we are seeing is that um, kind of what might be described as cyber warfare is coming to life right now, you know? Um, and I think that it's it's really not um, overstating reality to say that um, businesses are being targeted from a, um, uh, from state sponsored actors as well as, um, as, well as um, the states themselves. Um, so I think kind of, protecting organizations and their IT systems from external threats and from state-sponsored attacks, you know, is, is a key kind of um, thing that customers need to be thinking about at the moment. Um, slightly kind of um, behind that, I, but, but importantly, I think um, AI is becoming a key element in, um, in cyber attacks at the moment. And and automation of um, those cyber attacks is becoming key. So I think there's another trend there that perhaps you know customers need to be um, more cognizant of and, and think differently about how some of those attacks are, are going to manifest themselves on their systems. Um, I think the the importance of cyber security awareness can't be overstated. Um, the the easiest way to attack a system and attack and attack an organisation is still the people. Um, still just pretending to be someone getting access to, you know, accounts through a phishing attack or through a, um, some sort of, um, uh, some, some sort of um, trick of, a, of an individual, you know, in terms of giving away their credentials. So, um, so making sure that um, people in your organization are aware of their responsibility in the cybersecurity um, or in protecting the organization is, is key. Um, as many people that can not click on those links as possible, basically, you know, that, um, and, and I think the, 
The other thing I would say from a risk management perspective, something we've been saying for a long time, and I, and I hope is starting to land, is, is um, thinking of managing risk in a slightly different way um, and making sure that you're not just capturing. So when you're, when you're capturing information about how people are um, managing controls in your organization, there's a, a risk that um, you're asking them a question that they're inherently going to say and uh, give you a positive answer to. So if you if you say to someone, you know, are you managing all the risks I've asked you to manage? They're mm -hmm. probably going to say yeah. yes. You know, <laughs> saying no creates a lot more problems for them. And uh, that's kind of for me to know and you to find out, as it were. <laughs> um, so uh, so I think that what's important in the context of managing risk is that we don't just surface the opinions that we're getting from people around how they manage risk. But we also put some fact alongside that around whether those controls that we've been asking them to implement are being remediated, are being implemented. Um, and we get information in the risk management process, not just around self-assessment, but also around facts and you know, information, KPIs around whether those risks are, are being managed effectively. Now, Richard, one of the things I want to add also is the increased threat really because of the element of organized crime that has now permeated the cyber, cyber security and ransomware space over the last three years. And particularly in APAC, in the APAC region, where until very recently, there had been very little known or publicized uh, ransomware attacks. That's rapidly changing over the last couple of months. What's your view on this, particularly the involvement of the bad actors who are literally uh, organized crime, finding a new revenue stream now for, to, to get money from companies. Yeah, so, so I think the, um, the interesting thing here is that, um, particularly in, in Europe, what we've seen is that um, a lot of that organized crime goes, goes hand in hand with what I've just described around state-sponsored actors, right? Um, the um, the state-sponsored actors that we've seen over here um, tend to be quasi state sponsored in, in the sense that actually it's just a, an implicit um, not prosecuting organizations if they don't attack that particular state, for example. So, um, so we've seen, uh, you know, we've definitely seen trends over here where they kind of go hand in hand. And, and I absolutely agree, ransomware attacks are, are an enormous um, threat. Um, I, I didn't say that as being a trend this year because it's a trend that's ongoing from the last couple of years. It's um, it's still a growing threat. I absolutely agree. Um, and we, we've seen uh, we've seen those creating more and more problems for our customers, bringing their SAP systems down, for example, because the underlying databases have been um, locked up through ransomware attacks and things like that. And, no, and you... actually. Um, interestingly, we're also seeing insurance companies um, start to stop paying the ransoms, which was, you know, something that in the past it's it's kind of been a way you can insure your way out of ransomware attacks. We're we're starting to see, you know, those types of threats being uninsurable. So. And that's a very interesting thing because I think that was, as you said, a convenient way to kind of protect yourself by not protecting yourself as well. Just take insurance right. now. Yeah, I mean, managing risk, one of, one of the ways to manage risk is through insurance, right? And, and that we have seen companies kind of just sort of take the view that, yeah, they do the basics around protecting their systems, but if they, if they have an attack, the insurance will pay for that. Um, but uh, actually kind of the, the trend of paying the ransoms is, is definitely, it's not sustainable. I mean, whether it stops this year or next year or the following year, if, if the insurance companies keep paying the ransoms, then the you know the attackers are going to keep um, increasing the, the attacks because they never get paid. So now, Richard, then given this scenario and the, the, the business outlook for this year, what's the plan for Turnkey globally? So yeah, we've got some really interesting plans over the next year. So. Um, We've got a, a, a lot of work ongoing within the group um, around some reorganization work that we're doing to give ourselves the best opportunity to maximize the growth of the company. Um, and uh, we've got plans to expand in, in Europe, um, in Asia and in, in the US. Um, in particular, in the US, we're, um, we're, we're expanding very rapidly over there. And, and in APAC, um, 
one of our key kind of trends that we're seeing is that um, we're doing a lot more work with um, local customers. Uh, we're not, uh, our business over there is not all about um, offshore from other parts of our business, which a lot of, which we see, we see some customers, I think, sorry, some other um, systems integrators in, in APAC tend to see the APAC team as, as a kind of offshore team. And, and we actually take a really different view around our offshore um, team or our, our teams with delivery centers in, in Asia. We're, we're looking to build a team there that we can use across our group and, and um, we, to do exactly the same work as people across our group and not kind of see those, um, those teams in Asia as being a, um, uh, a, a team that we send the easier stuff to, if you like, and, and do the more difficult stuff customer facing. We're using our team in Asia for all of our customer facing work as well. So the, the, we don't see any difference. Our opportunity as a company is to actually tap into the skill pools across the, across the global group we have and, and use that skill pool to deliver for our customers wherever locations might be. And that's an opportunity that's been created for us by the pandemic, to be honest, being able to deliver our services primarily remotely um, means that we can use uh, people from anywhere in our team on any of our projects, which is a massive advantage for our customers. Now, Richard, I wanna ask you, I'm wearing the hat of a CIO in Asia Pacific, and I need to, in 2023, my budgets are cut, but I know I need to protect myself and I need to keep the lights on. What advice would you give me as a CIO as I run my large conglomerate? Um, so I think the um, as I I think going back to those trends I described, um, I think that one of the biggest um, areas that you can make an impact is actually in the cybersecurity awareness space. Um, it's a uh, it is if you ask me the kind of lowest hanging fruit to use a, a term we have here um, around um, uh, just making sure that people in your organisation understand their personal responsibilities in in managing risk for your organisation. So. So getting getting things right in that area um, and and just making sure that that kind of obvious back door is not wide open. Right. Because um, a lot of companies focus on a number of other topics and, and don't focus on that area. And it's kind of the the obvious area to um, to get right first. Um, I think the the other thing that um, we are seeing is that um, protecting uh, particularly kind of. Um, wider access and more higher privileged accesses. Um, people who've got wider access, obviously, if, if their passwords are um, breached, the risk to the organization is higher as well. But also third parties coming in and using that sort of uh, tend to have wide access as well. So getting some sort of solution in place to protect that, I think, is key. Um, and then we we see identity management as quite a key kind of trend in terms of the importance of of managing um, cyber risks across the organization more generally. Um, because I, I think the um, just getting the right access to the right people at the right time is a, a logical thing to do, but also um, just making sure that uh, you're taking away access when it isn't needed anymore and you've just got good hygiene around those topics, uh, I think is, is generally a, a an important sort of step to take in terms of improving your risk position in this space. Richard, it's been a fascinating conversation. I've really learned a lot. But before we leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, I think the the only other thing uh, I'd like to say really is that um, you know we would we would love it if you could join us on our journey to make the world a safer place to do business. Um, it's a it's a, a real passion for us as an organisation. I've I've created a team um, of people that are really passionate about getting this stuff right. Um, I think we, you know, we care more than any other company that you could trust to help you with this topic. And, and I'd love it if you, you would give us the opportunity to talk to you. Now, Richard, on that note, thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Thank you, Brian. Nice to, nice to meet you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak.
We've been speaking to Richard Hunt, CEO and founder of Turnkey Consulting out of the UK. I'm Brian Fernandez, and you've been watching and listening to BizTech CEO Conversation Show. This interview will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our social media platforms. It'll also be on our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Mm -hmm.